the eve of World AIDS Day. Despite all efforts, TB, a disease which is curable, not only continues to be the biggest infectious killer disease worldwide, but is also a lead cause of death for people living with HIV. No one needs to die of tuberculosis and living normally with HIV is very much possible. But we have a long way to go before this becomes a reality for every person living with HIV. No excuse for inaction. Let us remember the promises our governments have made by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals, one of which is to end tuberculosis and AIDS by 2030. Before we begin, I would like to make two quick announcements. All panelists are requested to please present in time so that we have good enough time left for questions and answers. Also, all participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions by using the chat function or raise the virtual hand. We will take questions as they stream in during the question and answer session. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator Ashok Ram Saru, a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa. Over to you, Ashok. Tomorrow is World AIDS Day. South Africa has been battling HIV as well as TB, but the latest W Health Organization Global TB report released recently shows that we have a long way ahead before we could end AIDS and TB both. Also, most shocking to me was to learn that instead of declining, TB deaths rose. 1.8 million people died from TB, including 400,000 who were co-infected with HIV as per the latest WHO Global TB report. Let me introduce the panel of experts in today's webinar. Dr. Anthony D. Harris, former senior advisor and director, Department of Research, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. Dr. Ishwar Gilada, elected national president of the AIDS Society of India, a national network of HIV specialists. Nama, Nama Pondo Barnabas of the Union, a strong advocate for community engagement in health responses. Monisola Adiboye, who will share personal experiences of living with HIV, and not forgetting our Madam Shoba, who is one of the Morsianus moderators. Well, our first panelist is Dr. Anthony D. Harris, who has served as Senior Advisor and Director, Department of Research, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. From, two, from 2008, till October 2016. He is also an honorary professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and spent over 20 years living and working in Sub-Saharan Africa. He is the author of hundreds of published papers on TB, HIV, AIDS, tropical medicine and the impact of operational research. It's now over to Dr. Harris for an in-depth knowledge of what's going on. Right, thank you very much uh, Ashok. So maybe I could ask Shoba to put up uh, the first slide because I've got a number of slides just to present um, for this talk. That's, that's the one, thank you. Um, so I'm going to slightly turn this on its head um, Ashok and I know this is about ending AIDS but I'm going to look at how if we tackle HIV AIDS properly, this can help us end tuberculosis and in so doing, if we end tuberculosis, we can make a significant impact on the HIV AIDS epidemic. So could I have a next slide please, Shobha? 
So the NTB strategy is quite clear. By 2030, in 15 years' time, we have to make a significant dent in reducing TB incidence, as you see, by 80%, and a significant dent in reducing TB-related mortality by 90%. Next slide. Now, HIV TB is a global problem, but three quarters of the burden of this, these two diseases actually reside in Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, 50% of the global burden, in fact, resides in the southern part of that continent in 10 countries. Next slide. So, if we look at tuberculosis, about one-third of the world's population carry the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis, in their bodies. We call this latent TB. And if people do not have HIV infection, they have a lifetime risk of this mycobacterium tuberculosis activating itself and causing active tuberculosis. And that lifetime risk is about 5 to 15%. However, if you're HIV infected, that risk rises hugely. HIV targets the CD4 lymphocyte. It's a very important white cell in the body that, in a sense, is in charge of the immune system. And as the CD4 count goes down, the risk, for example, of infections goes up. So overall, the annual risk of TB in HIV-infected people is 5 to 15 percent. That's an annual risk, not a lifetime risk. Next slide, please. Now, there are two things that determine this. First of all, the CD4 count of the HIV-infected individual. So this shows you that if the CD4 count is relatively high at around about 500, your annual risk of tuberculosis per year is about 3%. But as that CD4 count declines, that risk gets higher and higher. And below 50 CD4 cells per cubic millimeter, that risk is almost 25% per annum, basically a one in four chance of getting TB per annum. Next slide, please. The other factor, though, that determines the amount of or the risk of tuberculosis is the amount of TB exposure in the community. And this slide just shows you the risk of TB or the TB incidence rate at different CD4 counts in Italy, which is a low exposure country, compared with South Africa, which is a high exposure country. And you can clearly see that South Africa has a much higher risk of TB at any CD4 count compared with Italy. Next slide, please. So this is the basic message that antiretroviral therapy suppresses HIV replication. And this gradually leads to an increase in CD4 cell count. And an increased CD4 cell count protects against tuberculosis. Next slide, please. So this is a, a slightly complicated, but let me explain it, fairly easy slide. Um, it's a, it's a, a systematic review by somebody called Amitabh Sutha, looking at TB incidence rate ratios uh, in relation to baseline CD4 counts in people on antiretroviral treatment. And essentially, what, it, what TB IRR 0.35 means, if I put it into layman's language, is that antiretroviral treatment reduces the risk of tuberculosis by 65%. And that risk of, redu of tuberculosis being reduced is greater in people with low CD4 counts compared with those with high CD4 counts. That's probably quite understandable based on my earlier slides. But what this slide shows us and tells us is that it's good to start antiretroviral therapy as early as possible because at any level it will reduce the risk of TB. Next slide, please. So that's at the individual level. I want to show you very quickly two country scenarios. The first from Zimbabwe, showing you the in the top slide the rise 
in antiretroviral therapy scale up in the country, reaching nearly 700,000 people and reaching about 50% coverage of HIV infected people. And if you look at the slide underneath, you can see the TB case notifications declined during this 12 year period from 600 per 100,000 down to about 250 per 100,000. The antiretroviral treatment in Zimbabwe is making a significant impact in reducing the number of TB cases. Next slide, please. And this is Malawi, where I work, showing almost exactly the same, showing the rise in antiretroviral therapy, reaching nearly 50% coverage of the HIV-infected population, and TB case rates per 100,000 population decreasing from 250 to 120. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So one of the questions people ask is, will antiretroviral therapy do the job on its own of getting rid of tuberculosis? And this is an important slide that tells us no. So very quickly, in that blue box, you can see this is people on antiretroviral therapy looking at their CD4 count as it rises and looking at their risk of tuberculosis per year. And you can see that it, it starts at 25 per percent per year with very low CD4 counts and drops down to about 2.7. On the right hand side, you can see the TB rate in HIV uninfected people, which is 0.62. So basically this tells us that antiretroviral therapy can reduce our risk of TB, but it does not reduce it to the same level as in HIV uninfected people. Next slide, please. <laughs> so what else can we do? So <clears throat> this is the strategy, isoniazid preventive therapy. Isoniazid is an anti-TB drug, and if we give it to people living with HIV, it gets rid of latent tuberculosis, not in everybody, but in many people, and reduces the risk of tuberculosis by about 33%. Next slide, please. So this summarizes, if we add IPT, isoniazid preventive therapy, to antiretroviral therapy, we get an increased reduction in tuberculosis. So a very good study from South Africa, published in 2014, showing a 37% reduction in risk of tuberculosis when you use ART and IPT together, compared with just using ART. And then a study published in 2015, showing a 36 to 60% reduction in TB, again, using those two medications. Next slide, please. So in conclusion here, in people living with HIV, antiretroviral therapy is protective, it protects against TB, and it gives better overall protection at high CD4 counts. IPT, isoniazid preventive therapy, adds to this protection, particularly in high burden settings. We're not sure how long we should use IPT for, but probably indefinitely. So these two medications will reduce TB incidence and indirectly will reduce TB mortality. I've just got a couple more minutes, Ashok, if that's all right. Next slide, please. Yes, go ahead, sir. Now, TB patients sometimes come into the health services. They're diagnosed with TB, but they don't know they've got HIV infection. So one of the things we insist in Asia, in Africa, is that all TB patients are HIV tested. And if they're HIV positive, <coughs> there are two things we need to give them. One is something called cotrimoxazole preventive therapy. Cotrimoxazole is a very cheap, very simple antibiotic, maybe known in India and elsewhere as Bactrim or Cetrim. And if we give this just with anti-TB treatment, we get a 25% to 46% reduction in mortality. If you add in antiretroviral treatment, this in, on its own 
gives a 64% to 95% reduction in mortality. And if you combine the two tablets, that adds together to really significantly reduce mortality. Next slide, please. So I just want to show you some data at a program level from Malawi over eight years, showing you the gradual scale up of testing TB patients. So we started quite low at 26%, but we get eventually to 93%. You can see in the two bottom rows, most people start CPT, Cotrimoxazole Preventive Therapy, and there's a gradual scale up of antiretroviral therapy as the drugs became more available. Next slide, please. And you can see here what this did to treatment outcomes at a national level in smear positive pulmonary TB patients. Basically, death reduced from 19% to 8%. Other outcomes reduced from 10% to 3% to 4%, sorry. And treatment success rate increased up to 88%. So my last slide, please, Shobha. So finally, in patients with TB who are diagnosed with HIV infection, uh, the, the two things we must do is start antiretroviral treatment as soon as possible and start clotrimoxazole preventive therapy as soon as possible. And if we do this, this will actually prevent um, the TB mortality and this will help with our battle in trying to end both TB epidemics and HIV AIDS epidemics. Thank you very much, Ashok. I have finished. Over. Thank you very much, Doctor. That was Dr. Anthony D. Harris, former senior advisor and director of Department of Research, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, the Union. We now we are now joined by our next panelist, who is no stranger to CMS, is Dr. Ishwar Gilada was among the very first doctors in India to come forward to care for people living with HIV. He has mentored, mentored doctors in HIV care and management in India and several African nations over the past 35 years. He was co-chair of ESICON 2016 and co-chair of National Conference on Pulmonary Diseases on NAPCON 2016 that ended, that ended last Sunday, is now over to, well, is now over to our doctor, Ishwar Gilada. Yes, let's hear what's Hello. happening and what's coming up from there. Hello, Ashok, how are you? Thank you, G, I'm well, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm fine. Can we go ahead yes. now? Yes. We'll socialize later, first we go on topic. Yes, 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 you are well, but you are not just streaming at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay. Actually, I have been working in HIV since 1985, and I started India's first AIDS clinic in 1986. And earlier I worked in government, and now I am working in private. But I have been doing a lot of advocacy work with the government also. Now, my approach here is managing TB and HIV infection together. We need to have the program which will come together and we have been for the last two years campaigning for the convergence of these two programs. Uh, basically, we have a lot of major challenges. 50 to 70 percent of people with HIV do not know their HIV status. Most doctors are not interested in managing HIV and they keep away from HIV patients. Uh, less than 1 percent infected, 99 percent cannot be kept intact without their cooperation. And delayed public sector ART rollout, now it is morbidity initially. Uh, second line ART is still not available widely, and only one option is available for those second line drugs. Uh, recently they started third line ART also. There are there's always an issue of frequent stopouts in ART and also follow up uh, test kits like three food kits are uh, stop out. The network of lab and trained people is lacking. Lack of trained and uh, competent workforce at ART centers. Treatment guidelines they change so frequently and yet to be implemented as widely as uh, thoroughly as it should have been. Uh, with a broad range of ARVs, a uh, major challenge remains with opportunistic infections like tuberculosis and co infections as well as metabolic disorder management. Next, please. Next slide, please. 
Uh, often uh, in HIV, we see persistent generalized lymph node that is lymph node enlargement. And on the other side, in TB, you see lymph node uh, which is tuberculosis. And the TB can be seen almost every part of the body. By and large, people think that TB means only in chest. We have seen TB in the armpits. Next, please. And we have seen TB. Next slide, please. On the hand, you can see uh, this lady is a forgetting mass, and after treatment is uh, done. Her TB has been uh, cured or managed. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, in despite the system, it can be acute or chronic. In acute, we can see bacterial pneumonia, fungal PCP uh, or uh, uh, PCP pneumonia, viral. In chronic, there can be tuberculosis. There can be atypical mycobacterial infection, fungal infection, and malignancy. And always look for underlying TB. When we talk about HIV. Almost 50% people will have TB at one or the other point of time, and 30% of them uh, will have uh, extra pulmonary TB that is in the brain or in the abdomen. And sometimes the TB percentage can go up to 70 to 80% in HIV positive people. And almost 50% of the deaths in HIV they are related to tuberculosis. Next, please. This is PCP pneumonia, where we see uh, in, in the uh, lungs there is always. Uh, one, one, one phenomenon called ground grass appears, and we can also demonstrate PCP, but we have to, we have to do a bronchial ulnar lavage, which is a very much tedious procedure and not so easy to get a good clean. Next, please. TB HIV infection. Next, please. Now, often we compare TB and HIV. And they are diagonally opposite organisms. Tuberculosis is 0% preventable but 100% curable. HIV is 100% preventable but 0% curable. Tuberculosis is least glamorous, HIV is highly glamorous. After over a century existence, tuberculosis has only 12 to 13 molecules to treat them. And within 30 years, HIV has 22 molecules already uh, which are marketed and available, and over 30 in pipeline. Tuberculosis is always short of fun. HIV usually there is no depth of budget, but sometimes we face a crisis. Tuberculosis, TB follows in almost all HIV patients, but HIV may not follow in TB patients. Despite these contradictions, they coexist. They come from South and North Pole on the equator, and they are doing the human being. Next, please. Now, uh, India has been champion in the world in saving millions of lives. And to demonstrate that a uh, uh, medicine costing $10,439 per patient per year has been brought down to a remarkable $69 per patient per year. So it is less than 1% of international cost, but 100% of bioequivalence. And because of HIV or ART drugs, we know that world over, India has been contributing in all other pharma sector, including tuberculosis. So basically, if uh, making a molecule is important, Patriotic is important, it is also making them uh, affordable is more important. So today, four millions of lives are saved because of India rather than that of US or other powerful countries. Next slide. Now, we have to learn from the success and failure of TV. So what are their products? What is important is adherence to uh, prevent resistance. And in TV, we see MDR TV, XDR TV, this is because of people do not take medicines properly for some or the other reason. Then we have learned fixed drug combinations of different drugs only from TB. Before that, it was not well known. And uh, the world over, we taught antiretroviral manufacturers that three medicines can be combined and uh, one tablet can be taken once in a, at a night and that can uh, treat the patient for years and years. So, this is a great gift of tuberculosis program to HIV. Research on your molecules is very poor in TB and that HIV has taught the TB workers. Uh, commitment for long term involvement and working in coordination with several agencies is important at organization and individual level. And uh, as I already said, TB follows in almost all HIV patients, but reverse may not be true. Next please. You can see different type of tuberculosis. TB, pleural effusion, that means a water in lung, sometimes it can be 1.5 to 2 liter and often it has to be remote, which is called a therapeutic tap. You can also see hyalur node, where there is a big lymph node which can be seen 
uh, at the high level, in the lung, in the center part of the lung. Next, please. We, uh, here we can see extensive pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, first slide shows uh, left side completely gone. Second slide shows there is lot of infiltration in both the sides. Is not, lung is not clear. Next slide. Please. We can also see pericardial involvement or heart involvement with uh, tuberculosis and that is called pericardial infusion where the heart is so much enlarged but it is filled with the tuberculosis water. It can be also mediastinal nephropathy where lymph nodes are enlargement. Next slide. Please. We can see abdominal lymph nodes. We can see, see spleen microabscesses because of tuberculosis. Next slide. Please. We have seen tuberculosis in liver. Liver was enlarged and we uh, did FNSC and uh, we found that it was teeming with acid fast bacilli, which are red rods which can be seen in the liver. Next slide. We can also see tuberculosis in the groin or in the sex organ. Next slide, please. This is called scopulodermia. Yeah. The TB lymphopathy, this man has got lymph node enlargement for the last five years. He is not MDR, but still, as soon as you stop the treatment, his TB gland grows up. Again, he comes back, again, we start the treatment. And now, finally, he succumbed. So, we don't know what was the mechanism, but for five years, he was continuously on treatment. And it was not MDR. Next slide. The Bantu test or tuberculin test is very common to understand tuberculosis mechanism and also what is response to tuberculosis uh, challenge. Here you can see blistering, that means the person is infected, though x ray may be showing normal, though he is subclinical, some infection some may be there, but this can be diagnosed with this kind of blistering that person is infected differently. Next slide. And here, after you start HIV treatment, if TB has not been well managed earlier, then person can get swellings and sometimes the person uh, gets swelling in different places and tuberculosis increases. This is called iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And sometimes iris is more fatal than HIV or tuberculosis per se. Next slide. And sometimes the TB looks so big. Sometimes we are confused whether it is a lymphoma type or, which is a type of a cancer or TB. And here it was tuberculosis, but in another cases we got lymphoma like this. Next slide. So this is a very much unusual tuberculosis. But if when you talk, uh, manage HIV or TB, you need to do a comprehensive management. You have to do psychosocial and emotional management, you have to do recreational and physical management, you have to do nutritional management, you have to tell people what they should eat, what is high protein diet. Simply you can't just say that we eat protein, people do not know what is protein, where is protein. And medical management, biological and bacteriological management and immunological management. And just because you are offering everything, the treatment should not be uh, very expensive, it should be cost efficient. Next. Dr. Gilata, may I request you to wind up, uh, just uh, take one yeah, minute. Uh, maybe two or three slides in there. So okay. comprehensive management should cover everything, but managing complexion is very uh, tricky job. Other four jobs can be done very easily. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There are a lot of emergency issues and uh, uh, positive positive marriages and MSM issues where there is a law uh, of uh, Section 370 and people are challenged, but still that law exists and MSM people get harassed. Next slide, please. So basically what we are planning that we bring people together, families, beneficiaries, caregivers on one platform and they should fight and that is what is required either to fight tuberculosis or HIV or both HIV and TB together. Next slide please. And HIV has given some messages. I have AIDS, please help me, I can't give, uh, give you, uh, uh, I can't give you HIV or I can't make you sick. But tuberculosis can. So Basically, in tuberculosis, mask is required and HIV mask is not required. So, these are two complex situations we, we, we need to handle together. And I would like to thank everybody. Uh, if there are any questions, I am willing to answer them. Thank you.
Thank you very much. That was Dr. Ishwar Gillada, President of the AIDS Society of India, ASI, and co-chair of the 18th National Conference on Pulmonary Diseases, NAPCON 2016. Well, Doctor, you set the stage perfectly to invite Noma Pondo Barnabas of the Union to share personal experiences on why community engagement. Why community engagement is key to health responses. Now it's over to you, Noma. Hello. It's over to Noma. It's over to Noma. Hello. Uh, uh, I think Monisola can present. Uh, Ashok, you can ask Monisola to present because Noma okay, is not here now. Okay, great, great. Well, let's listen to our fire, our panelist, Monisola Boyer, who was here personal experience of living with HIV and why community and health responses. It's now over to Noma. Sorry, it's now over to Monisola. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, there is there is some background noise. Can't hear you, Moni. I can hear you. Okay, it's over to you. Yes, Moni, we can hear you. Please continue. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, I'm going to share my experience of the person living with HIV and I'm asking the person. Um, it was um, a very terrible experience. I got this Very clearly, there is a lot of background noise. We cannot hear Monisola very clearly. Hello, hello Shoba. Yes, is that Noma? Yes, initially that... I was muted. And, uh, yes, yes, initially okay. I could not. I, I, okay. I couldn't okay. unmute myself. Okay, Noma, now please begin. You can begin, please. Uh -oh. Okay, thank you once again for the invitation. Um, I, I think the topic is, is, is good. It came just at the right time or post um, the, the, the AIDS conference in Devon, where the key message that I brought home for me was really integration, um, integration of TB and HIV. And today the theme is uh, to end AIDS by 2030. Um, we have to stop neglecting TB. From the community perspective, um, I, I, I would touch a bit on the report by, by, by WHO. Um, the report from, from WHO really came as a shock to many um, civil society groups because the whole focus is on, on HIV and um, we felt that the 
maybe they did not capture the work done around TB, but we feel that the core um, report on WHO is, is, is around TB. And for years, this is again what I'll be sharing is in consultation with few CSOs that have seen the report. Um, and for years we have not known the true burden of TB because of many things, including the weakness in data collection, because we feel that's another gap of proper reporting and the data that is out there. Either reporting or health systems, and the number are clearly tenfold to show the gaps in working being done under the ground, either nationally or regionally. And so far we have seen that the civil society have been next in the mandate to promote treatment literacy around TB. And again, using best practice from HIV uh, 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 literacy. So civil society is again embarking on, on educating um, the, the community around TB literacy. And while we can't complain about funding challenges, we have failed to educate communities about their rights and have essentially handed the TB burden over to government. And that also leads me to identify the gap um, within TB response, TB programs, where we have failed to position TB within the human rights agenda. And we feel that it seems like that this is a big mistake. And this data from WHO TB report shook shocked the civil society into thinking about how we could start evaluating our current practices, including advocacy, because we need to advocate for TB programs just like we did with HIV to prevent, actually, like where we are today with, with HIV. And we need the same practices, the same advocacy, the same advocacy um, strategies that we applied for HIV to also apply them with TB if we want to end TB by 2013. 2030, sorry. And looking at how we can coordinate better to take this agenda back to the community and to strengthen, build community systems to increase mobilization around rights-based responses to TB. And hopefully, this will lead to improve outcomes to ensure that communities own and articulate their own TB responses. Okay, and again, the role of civil society also came up strongly for me um, while we were in Liverpool from the 47th World TB Conference. The role played by civil society in TB programs at community level with limited resources, but, and, and, and the key, the importance of building their capacity in, in order for them to, to be able to educate their communities. Now, looking at what people are saying on the ground, what actions are being taken to reduce TB co-infection by civil society organizations? The report only came in October. There has not been enough time to generate decent community responses. And as I say that, what I'm sharing is from the few civil society who had access to that report. There has not been any proper community outreach um, sharing the, the report with them and getting their, their, their views. And from the few that we have, we have received, in the actual sense that we have received negative reactions to the report, and there is a confusion as to whether the high numbers of TB are linked to TB and HIV, or if they are standalone, which I think most of the presentations by the two previous speakers, the two doctors, showed that, but again, do we send out those messages out to the broader community so that they are clear where we're standing? There is alarm as to whether or not government programs have been providing IPT to HIV positive people. But I think that we've just had the good um, experience from India um, just now. And I think Malawi as well from, from Dr. Harrison as well. And this response have mainly come from organizations who are focusing on HIV interventions and are now concerned about TB as the poor cousin to HIV. But there has not been enough anger from this or around TB. Oops. Oh, gosh. Uh. Okay. There has, but there has been not enough anger from civil society around TB, and clearly a realignment of the status quo is needed. Um, and we also felt, again, that what we also appreciate, we, we cannot overlook, 
that there's quite a few um, research efforts going around for TB drugs to come up with shorter regimen if we were to look at the issue of infection and co-infection, if one has to look at the issue of pill bedding. And also, this, I, we know that researchers are working tirelessly to also try and conquer the different drug-resistant uh, TB uh, strains. I, I think for me briefly, that is all from my side, maybe if there are questions that can come up. Thank you very much. That was Noma Pondo Barnabas from the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the union. Well, what you shared must be in the heart of health responses. Let us now listen to our final panelists before the Q&A. Moni Sola Ajiboye, who will share personal experiences of living with HIV and why community engagement is key. Now over to Monisola Ajiboye. Monisola, we cannot hear you. There is a lot of disturbance. Okay. Yes. Around this. Yes. Who knows around here? Who knows around here? Can you hear me now? A lot of background disturbance if you can hear. No, I'm a little bit quiet here. You cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? No, little better, but still we can't. it's not very clear. Okay, let me speak up louder. Yes. Okay, I said I will be speaking as a person who is with HIV. Can you hear now? Yes, yes. yes okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. I'll be speaking as a person living with HIV and who has had tuberculosis and is still the CD. Um, I had a very terrible experience in 2005 because I was first detected with HIV and I was placed on drugs. And after some months, I started coughing and had to go for the CD treatment. But um, then we didn't have a comprehensive treatment center where you can take HIV and tuberculosis treatment at the same time. So I was actually assessing my HIV drug somewhere very far from my community and then I had to go for the CB test uh, in my community. So when I got to where I was taking my, I, was, I went for the CB test, I didn't tell them about my HIV setup and they didn't bother to do the HIV test. They just um, did the test completely on drugs. So I was, I, and then I didn't know then that I was not supposed to take therapy and refer to pain at the same time. So I was taking both at the same time and then after some weeks, like two weeks, I started have complications. So I went to the HIV clinic where I was taking my treatment and I told them that I'm placed on the CB treatment. And then immediately they had to change my drug from the therapy to evaluate. Uh, and the, the, the effect was terrible on me because uh, I had I lost my memory for six months. I could hardly remember anything. And then um, he, he, I had some other complications. I have a neuropathy. I could hardly do anything for over six months. And um, the, it is very important at this stage that we involve communities about uh, tuberculosis. The awareness is still very low. We need to do more of awareness in our communities. Even right now, as in 2016, I'm, I, I'm sharing the experience of 2005. In as 2016 in Nigeria, we still have some communities that are very, very rural, and um, they know very little about tuberculosis. And I'm telling you that tuberculosis is still the lead killer of people in the community, it's still faster than HIV. I'm doing a project on tuberculosis, and um, I can tell you categorically that every month we get not less than 10 people that has tuberculosis. And because they live in a very um, poorly density area, they spread it faster to their immediate family. And the case is even becoming very worse now because it's not just tuberculosis that they're having. They're having multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And the, the age range is, is, is alarming. We are having people under the age of 18 years, 16, that are having multi-drug resistant TB. And it's becoming very, very troublesome in Nigeria now because of the, the, the uh, economy, uh, positive economy, 
And then with the recession that we have now, many of them are even dying because they could hardly afford to eat. And I'm telling you, talking to you right now, I lost a patient yesterday. He has been on TV drugs, but he died because of nutrition. No money to feed. And he has he has wife and children depending on him. So like um, one of the presenters mentioned that nutrition is also part of care for people living with tuberculosis. We should look at nutrition, we should look at the medical aspect of it as well. If a patient is taking um, medication and is not on good nutrition, the medication will not work very well for that patient. So tuberculosis is still the lead killer of people. And like one of the, 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 the presenters also said, that you have more people that are tuberculosis positive than people with HIV. You can have somebody that has tuberculosis and is not HIV positive. Or you have people that are HIV positive, the chances of somebody that is HIV positive having tuberculosis is very high. So we still need more awareness of tuberculosis and we need more funding to go into tuberculosis. Because it's like we have to we focus more on HIV. But tuberculosis infection is even the, 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 the way tuberculosis is being um, spread is faster. Because with an airborne disease, it's faster than comparing it to HIV. So we need partners, we need donors to put more funding into tuberculosis programming. It is high time that we started putting funding, we started doing more awareness, we started, started doing more campaign, even in our local community. We need more funding so that people can be aware about tuberculosis. People see HIV to be more deadly, but tuberculosis is far, far, far more deadly and more contagious than HIV. So we need more partners, we need more donors to put funding to create more awareness. So we at the rural area, at the grassroots, can create more awareness, especially in the poor areas where we have poor, I mean, we have a poorly density area, where you have lots of people living in very rural area and, and it's easily spread. So we need more of this, we need more engagement of the community. And then it is even also very important that if we are doing TV programming, we should also focus on engaging the community itself. Community engagement is very, very key. Stakeholders, engaging them, letting them know about, let them be the, the, let them be the driver, let them be as the driver to the people to also talk about it. Like what we are doing in our organization is we got people who call community tuberculosis workers, they live in that community, and most of them are really killed of TB. So they also stand as testimonials to other people to tell them that tuberculosis is curable. And then they also go and do sensitization to their community members get samples directly to go in, they do how to have touch. That's what they do. They go to their houses, collect, collect the samples from them, bring it to the office, and we transport it to the lab. And when we find out that the, 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 the sample is positive, we also go back to the community, get the client, and take the client to the facility to start the treatment. And we don't have that just allow the, uh, the client to start treatment. We also do follow up to ensure that the client stays on treatment and finish his or her treatment. But the greatest challenge we are having now is nutritional support. Because most of them, because they are down, they cannot no longer go to work. They also need nutritional support to support their family. So tuberculosis needs more funding this time around. There should be more focus on tuberculosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was Moni Sola Ajiboye, who shared a personal experiences of living with HIV and why community engagement is key to health responses. Well, it's, it's a good time to open the floor for uh, questions and answers. It's now over to Madam Shobha Shukla, Executive Director and Managing Editor of Citizen News Service, CNS India. It's now over to Madam Shobha. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, we have Diana Vangari. Uh, from Kenya, who is a medical doctor and writes, uh, is a CNS correspondent and writes for the Star Kenya. Diana, would you like to ask your question? If Diana is there, she can ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, my question is to Dr. Harris specifically. Uh, and it's regard to TB and HIV co-infection. Uh, when in med medical school at the time, uh, the recommendation was that um, you initiate uh, the anti-TB drugs 
for the first two months and thereafter you can uh, proceed with the antiretrovirals as you're continuing with the continuation phase of anti-TB drugs. Is, still, is this still the recommended uh, dosage Re regimen rather? Right, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dean. I thank thought you much, uh, sure. I should I will respond or, or what? Pardon? Shall I respond? Yes. 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 Please go ahead. Okay. So, Dina, thank you very much for, for that question. Um, when when um, we first started using antiretroviral drugs at a sort of national scale about 12 years ago, um, it was recommended that exactly as you say, we start TB treatment, we wait two months until the initial phase of treatment was completed, and then we, then we got people started on antiretroviral therapy. But in fact, uh, Dina, that's now changed. Um, in 2011, there were some very good clinical trials done in Africa um, and also in other parts, South America and Asia, showing that it's good to try and start antiretroviral therapy um, at about two weeks after the start of anti-TB treatment. And in fact, now, with better antiretroviral drugs and safer antiretroviral drugs, there's not so much danger of uh, what we call drug-drug interactions. Um, in the past, we used to be worried about something called nevirapine and rifampicin, but now the standard antiretroviral drug is efavirenz, and that does interact with rifampicin, but not nearly so much. So uh, the basic, uh, the simple answer to your question is, we should try and start antiretroviral therapy about two to four weeks after starting anti-TB treatment. Over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Harris. Uh, Randall Reeves has uh, uh, some questions to ask. Randall, are you there to ask the question? Uh, can you hear me? I, I typed in a question. Uh, it's for Dr. Harris. The uh, study in Botswana showed that uh, all the benefit of INH treatment, even in the, the, the patients receiving it for 36 months, was really limited to those with a positive skin test. So my question is, you know, why isn't tuberculin skin testing recommended rather than giving IH to everyone? Yeah, a uh, very good question, uh, Randall. Uh, Randall. So let me let me just try and answer answer that. Um, there was a further study, Randall, done in South Africa, the one I showed on my slide by Rangaka and her colleagues, which in fact showed that the benefit of isoniazid with antiretroviral treatment happened regardless of tuberculin skin testing. <laughs> so that, that was a little bit different to what was shown in, in Botswana. And the reason that that is reassuring is that there's a global shortage of tuberculin at the moment. So it actually is quite difficult to get hold of this. Uh, tuberculin skin testing is quite, uh, uh, quite a, an, an, an effort to do. I mean, I used to try doing this in Malawi. You have to give the injection properly, the patient has to come back after 48 to 72 hours, you have to read what's called the induration um, correctly on the skin. It's not an easy thing, it's not an easy thing at all. So I think following Rangaka's study, and also this was found in Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, that um, isoniazid works regardless of that tuberculin skin testing. I think the consensus is we don't have to worry about tuberculin skin testing. I mean, obviously, if one could do it simply, if one could do it um, easily, then you do get a better, a better effect. But it is so difficult to do that it's a sort of obstacle, if you like, to trying to scale up this intervention. Over. Thank you. Uh, Rakesh Kumar. Uh, from a Hindi newspaper in Bihar, uh, has a question for Dr. Gelada. Uh, he says, I'm confused. Should we use CD4 cutoff or not? What is the right thing to do as here 
ART is only given when CT4 count drops below a certain cutoff point. Dr. Gilada. Is Dr. Gilada there to answer the question or maybe Tony can answer? Um, I'm happy to answer if, if uh, Ishwa is not there, but if Ishwa is there, then over to him. I, 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 I don't think he's responding. Okay, so, all right. Let me, let me, let me come in yeah. here. Um, again, yeah. very good question, Rakesh. Thank you. Um, if you look at uh, WHO guidelines, Rakesh, over the last 12 years, um, they very much were, they very much said that antiretroviral treatment should be based on the CD4 count. And as you probably know, 12 years ago, it was less than 200. Um, if they went up to 350, um, about six years ago, three years ago, they raised the bar to 500. And now, the latest WHO guidelines released in July this year say that if you're HIV infected, whatever your CD4 count is, you should start antiretroviral therapy. It's what we call a test and treat approach. So I think this is, uh, this is very good. I think there's clear evidence to show that at any CD4 count, antiretroviral therapy provides survival benefit. And it also cuts down the amount of HIV virus in the blood and means that that person is less infectious to others. So, so this, in a way, will really help to end the AIDS epidemic because that person will be less infectious and less able to transmit HIV to his or her partner. Over. Thank you. Uh, Zafar from Bangladesh has a question for Noma and Monisola both. Zafar says, Community engagement is the talk of every health program, but why is it not happening? What is the biggest obstacle? <laughs> ah, that's a very good question. Um, okay, maybe let me jump in first. Um, I, I, I really don't know. I agree. Everybody in most of the presentations, as I also referred to IAS conference in Durban, um, even in, in, in Liverpool, in our own conference, it, the, the, the role of civil, civil society or civil society engagement came up as one of the cornerstones, but it's not working. I think for me, what, what I think would work is instead of having the program implementers or the, the, the program managers, whoever, telling us how we need to be engaged, it should be us telling them how we need to be engaged. And in that way, as I was also referring to issue of owning the process, because if we tell them how we need to be engaged, that way we'll be able to own it. And another gap that I've identified is issue of funding. Because again, you can, even if you look at different programs, there's so many, the, a large portion of that funding would go to program implementation and a small portion for civil society engagement. So at the end of the day, it's again about us making noise to say we, this is how we want to be engaged and these are the resources that we need. Thank you. Noma, would you like to respond? It was, it was me uh, talking, Shoba. Oh, okay. okay, okay, sorry. Then Monizola, sorry. <laughs> Okay. I, I, would, uh, I would want to support what Noma just said. Most of the time we have um, the partners, the founders, already designing the, pro the, the, the programs for us. They already designed the plans for us, not engaging the community to sit down and plan how they want to be engaged. So I want to support Noma that the community should be part of the planning from inception. Because they actually knows, like we have the problem that either wear the shoes, know where it pinches. But you have partners already designing the programs for us, and they want us to actually carry it out that way. And at the end of it all, it doesn't work. And then in terms of funding, like Norma said, we need more funding for TB. Most fundings are going into HIV, they are going into other uh, programmings. 
but fundings are not actually, so we have very little percent of fundings going for TB. So I think this is high, high time that we started talking and, you know, making a, a noise, talking about it, creating awareness and talking about it, that TB needs more funding. And then engaging community from the planning stage is very, very important. Thank you. Uh, I think Dr. Srikant Tripathi wants to ask a question. Would you like to ask yourself, please? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can very clearly. Well, uh, uh, SNT could be ideal way to uh, treat HIV, both from the angle for treatment of the HIV infected person, for prevention of transmission, as well as uh, prevention of TB. But uh, do we have the resources to implement it? Will you please introduce yourself also? Uh, I am uh, I work at the National Institute for Research in Tuberculosis in Chennai in India. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Harris, would you like to answer his question? I didn't, I'm afraid I, it didn't come through that clearly, my intro, but it's, could you, could you just repeat it? Was yes, it about the sources? Yes. Or? Yes, he said yeah, that test, yeah. yes, please repeat. But test do we have the resources to implement it in developing countries? Yes, okay, I, I, I thank you Dr. Shapati, it's a very, it's a good question. So, so a very good question. Um, you know, WHO now recommends that everybody who's HIV infected should be treated with antiretroviral therapy. I think uh, the estimates are that there are something like 36 to 38 million people living with HIV globally. So if you translate that into expense just for antiretroviral treatment, and let's assume that um, with the generic drugs that we have available, it's about $100 per person per year, something like that. That's a lot of money that's required. Um, and so, so the question is, I think, um, uh, Dr. Shapati, um, whether the national governments can step up to the plate, whether the global fund, which generally funds a lot of antiretroviral treatment, gets enough support in the next 15 years to basically pay for antiretroviral therapy. And finally, and this applies mainly uh, to Africa, um, in the last 10 years, Dr. Tripathi, um, uh, PEPFAR, the President Bush's emergency plan for AIDS relief in Africa, was very good at supporting antiretroviral treatment in Africa. Um, of course, we're going to get a new uh, a president next year in America. So whether President Donald Trump will support um, money for this, we don't know. So I think I think there's a question mark over whether we will have enough resources. But it's an expensive business. Over. Thank you. Uh, just one last question from Randall. An interesting question. Uh, the question says that the success of community engagement for HIV involved all economic segments of communities, not just those in poverty. In the case of T there is a although there is a strong link between poverty and both in both TB and HIV, but in the case of TB, some patients have told me I couldn't have TB. I'm not poor. Is the emphasis of poverty in the field of TB a cause? that is uh, poverty is a cause of TB, increasing the stigma of TB and limiting full community engagement. The question is to Monisola and Noma. That is too much emphasis on poverty acting as a hindrance for full community engagement. Um, it's Noma again here, Shobha. Yes, yes, Noma. I'm not sure whether we really, when we, we link poverty to, to TB, if we really are, are certain, because in my experience, I've seen people contracting TB who are not living in, pover in poverty. Yes, previously it, it used to be the case, but not anymore. So uh, I, I'm not sure whether we really, when we talk about linking poverty to TB, whether we really have 
the, the, the facts or, 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 or that. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I can say for, for now. As I said, that I do have experiences. That's why, like, I can make an example of an organization, TB Proof, which are medical professionals who have acquired TB in their practice, and they're not living in poverty. So I think we have, the, 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 the paradigm has shifted from, from that, from that, uh, that it's linked to, to poverty. It, the, the, there is occupational exposure, which can be, can a person in, who is not living in poverty can, can get TB. So I, I really wouldn't think that, that it's also a stumbling block to community engagement. Stigma, yes, I agree. There's still a lot of stigma around TB, just like you experience stigma in, in HIV as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one last question from me, uh, and that is uh, directed to Tony and Dr. Gelada, if Dr. Gelada is there. Uh, are, do diabetes and other NC Hello, I didn't, uh, Shubha, I didn't catch that. Hello, this is Rahul. Uh, the question is, um, if uh, diabetes and uh, other NCDs interact with uh, TB and HIV, so show by um, hello. I'm happy to try and answer I'm, that. If Ishwa would like to go go ahead, but um, you guide me, please. You can go ahead, Doctor. Okay, thanks, Ashok. So, um, yeah, definitely, there's there's good evidence, and a lot of this uh, based on great work done in India um, and and in other other countries in Asia. But diabetes uh, certainly has an important part to play with tuberculosis. Um, we know that diabetes increases the risk of tuberculosis by a factor of three times compared with the normal population. So if you're diabetic, you're three times at more risk of getting TB. And if you get tuberculosis and you have diabetes and TB, you're at higher risk of dying during TB treatment and in fact doing badly during TB treatment and getting tuberculosis again once your TB treatment has been completed. So. So that, that's, that's, that's um, been proven by many, many pieces of work in the last uh, 10 years. Um, with regard to diabetes and HIV, not quite so sure, but certainly with HIV, as people get onto antiretroviral treatment, they put on weight and they get better, there's a risk that those people can develop hypertension. So it's important now to begin to think about non-communicable diseases. Um, and certainly I know that CDC in America is running various pilot um, studies, if you like, in Africa, looking at whether we can measure people's blood pressure and treat blood pressure in HIV clinics. So these two areas, communicable diseases, TB, HIV, undoubtedly are interacting with non-communicable diseases, diabetes and hypertension. Over. Thank, thank you, Doctor. It was a, well, you heard the explosive views coming through from our panelists, Dr. Anthony D. Harris, Dr. Ishwar Gilada, Moni Sola Ajiboye, Namapondo Barnabas, and of course, not forgetting our Madam Shoba Shukla of CNS, and Tomorrow is World AIDS Day for December 2016. Let's fight to reduce the numbers. Thank you very much indeed to all our guests and to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.